Dilophosaurus has been known for a long time. Contrary to what is shown in Jurassic Park, a handful of pretty good specimens gives us a clearly different image of what kind of predator it was. Not a tiny short-skulled venom-spitting frill beast, the real Dilophosaurus could reach the size of the short bus, stand taller than a horse, and bore twin, teardrop crests of thin, brittle bone. It came from the early Jurassic, a time when the dinosaurs were kicking it into evolutionary overdrive. Despite general knowledge of its anatomy, there's a nearly complete adult specimen which has avoided the scientific literature for one reason or another. It has finally been described and published, and it changes the way we'll see Dilophosaurus forever. During the summer of 1942, Dr. Charles Camp and Samuel Wells of the University of California Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley, California, set out on a joint expedition to Arizona. Dr. Camp was looking for Permian stuff, while Wells was looking for Triassic stuff. At the end of the field season, Dr. Camp had to return to Berkeley, so he had Wells investigate a report of a mysterious skeleton. Sam Wells and team met with the owner of a local trading post, Richard Curley. Curley introduced Wells and Company to Navajo Jesse Williams, who was the one who reported the skeleton. With him were some fossils he had discovered two years prior. The team was ecstatic, and Williams took them to where he'd originally found the bones. The prehistoric grave site, near Fossil Trackway site in Monave, included three theropod dinosaur skeletons in a purplish shale. The first skeleton was rather complete, missing only a piece of the skull, parts of the pelvis, and some vertebrae. The second skeleton was well eroded, but still consisted of the front part of the skull, the lower jaws, some vertebrae, chunks of leg bones, and the entire hand. The third was so far along the erosional process that it was only pieces of vertebrae. Ten days of intensive field labor were enough to excavate and jacket the fossils. The more complete of the specimens was cleaned and mounted for exhibition at the University of California Museum of Paleontology. Under the supervision of Dr. Juan Langston Jr., the museum team reconstructed a whole Dilophosaurus skeleton based on the three they'd found, as well as the English Streptospondylus and Morrison Allosaurus. Mounted in bas relief as a wall piece, the entire skeleton was the most complete theropod skeleton known from the U.S. at the time. Splayed out in almost two dimensions, the body was slightly distorted from its original position to show all anatomical details. In this photo, the skull can be seen reconstructed in a strange way. Where are the crests for which it got its name? At the time they made this reconstruction, the crests were unknown and the name Dilophosaurus had yet to be made. Samuel Wells wrote up a quick description of the fossils and curiously referred it to the, at the time still fragmentary, Megalosaurus of England. Another specimen of Dilophosaurus would be found not 400 meters, a quarter mile south of the last remains. In 1964, this specimen, a nearly complete adult, was excavated from the early Jurassic mudstones of northern Arizona and prepared at the California Museum. Once prepared, it preserved every unique characteristic of Dilophosaurus which had been missing or misinterpreted in the first specimens, and the California Museum team quickly made the changes to the wall-mounted skeleton. Sam Wells broadened his knowledge of theropod dinosaurs by studying many of them and figured the new creature with twin crests atop its skull was way too different from Megalosaurus, and Dilophosaurus was born. It is this large, nearly complete adult Dilophosaurus skeleton which has now finally been described. The specimen lay in the California Museum of Paleontology for more than a half century, until Dr. Adam Marsh and Dr. Tim Rowe got around to painstakingly describing every aspect of it in what might be one of the most comprehensive monographs made in the last decade. The previous knowledge bank on Dilophosaurus was thought complete by many. But this new study published in the Journal of Paleontology shows we still have a lot to learn about the double-crested lizard. 
This monograph provides a much clearer look at what an adult Dilophosaurus skull looked like. Based on a few crushed skulls, missing pieces here and there, a generalized skull can be created. The old reconstruction of the animal's skull had long, thin jaws and a pronounced kink in the upper jaw between the bone called the premaxilla and this bone called the maxilla. The old skull also had long, thin teeth and crests ending in a bony spur, pointing backwards at the end of the skull. The monograph changes these details up a bit. The lower jaw was far more robust. This thing was powerful and used for holding onto prey items and not letting go. The kink in the upper jaw wasn't as pronounced as previously thought, as the original bones were altered from the fossilization process. The teeth, though still fragmentary, were not as long as previously shown. I think the biggest change are the crests. They were bigger, and their structure was quite unlike anything anyone thought it'd be. The twin crests were concave inward, so the depression of the crest was pointed toward the midline of the skull. They fused to the snout as well as the top of the skull and stopped right past the eye. The new description reconstructs the skull with a pair of pointed splints of bone above the eye. These are also fused to the crest and act as a margin. This means the crest would be concave and bent at its back end over the eye. Taking the concave structure into account and considering how close the twin crest would have been in life, the authors and artists have speculated they may have been the bony core for a much larger structure. The internal structure of the double crests makes this idea more convincing. What was originally thought to be solid thin plates of bone was actually hollow. The inside was very similar to the casks of hornbills, cassowaries, and the beaks of toucans. The crests of these modern dinosaurs are hollow, with bars of bone crisscrossing each other in a honeycomb fashion. This strengthens bones and saves weight. This level of sponginess, called pneumaticity, is present throughout much of Dilophosaurus' body, particularly the vertebrae. Hollow, but reinforced bones are implicated as an adaptation for large size. Contrary to the shrimpy stature of the Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park, Dilophosaurus was truly massive. Taking all five specimens into account, these theropods are estimated to have reached around 7 to 8 meters, 23 to 26 feet. Dilophosaurus was the largest land carnivore at the time, and may have been this large to deal with food sources which were also increasing in size. The Sauropodomorphs Dilophosaurus shared its early Jurassic ecosystem with animals like Cerasaurus, which were long-necked bipedal herbivores with forearms tipped in bulky hooked claws. The small armored ornithischian Scutellosaurus scurried beneath the feet of large predators like Dilophosaurus. Forms such as Scutellosaurus would split and diversify into the Scalidosaurus, Stegosaurus, Notosaurus, and Ankylosaurus. The early Jurassic was a period which also saw the increase in body size across other theropods. Exactly what Dilophosaurus was, what it was related to, and where it belongs in an hypothesis of theropod evolution has been murky at best. Over the 80 years of research on Dilophosaurus, it has been considered part of the lightly built Coelophysoidea, its own unique group, Dilophosauridae, or among the misfit group, Stem Titanurin Theropoda. Both Dilophosaurus and the Coelophysoids were more advanced members of the non avirostrin Neotheropod group, along with Zupesaurus, Dracovenator, and Cryolophosaurus. This has held up to the scrutiny of the new paper. Dilophosaurus was placed near the 20-foot, 6-meter Cryolophosaurus of Antarctica and the Argentinian 13-foot Zupesaurus. The early Jurassic period saw an explosion of big crested theropods. What were once thought to be close relatives due to the crests were actually different ways of doing the same thing. Yes, what the other news outlets have reported non-stop is true. Jurassic Park got the Lophosaurus wrong. The thing is, Jurassic Park wasn't trying to get it right. The artists and consultants working on Jurassic Park tried to stick to the bones as best they could, and then skewed the outside anatomy to their content, but more importantly, Spielberg's content. It was also made when the true image of Dilophosaurus was a lot different than it is now. When Dinosaurs Roamed America is another piece of paleomedia which has depicted Dilophosaurus. Yeah, yes, it's, it's technically wrong in a few places now, 
Does that make its unnervingly metallic screams any less horrifying? No. This documentary did try to stick to what was known at the time, and I'm not gonna fault it for that. It was correct at the time. Brian Eng, chief paleoartist commissioned to create art and exhibit materials for this study and the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site, has produced an award-winning practical effect Dilophosaurus head and neck and foot puppet. Along with these, he's made a couple part animatronic part puppet effects of a theropod called Megapnosaurus. He's also created a life-sized, fleshed-out reconstruction of an adult Dilophosaurus based on the new find to go along with one of the best fossil trackways in the world, housed at the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site. His Walking with Dinosaurs style documentary footage is spectacular, and I recommend you go check out his channel, Brian Ang Paleoart. I'll leave a link here and in the description. More great science will be done with these new findings. The crests of every single Dilophosaurus are fragmentary and don't show the full extent in life. Perhaps new techniques of reconstruction or new specimens will elucidate exactly what shape they took, or if they held a cask-like keratin structure. It's been provisionally hypothesized the two crests may have merged together as one crest with the help of a keratin cover. Maybe they were the bowls which held sac-like structures which inflated like a frigate bird's or, as paleoartist John Conway speculative reconstructed, here in an Allosaurus. It's not out of the question. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this, and hit the notification bell just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Thanks goes to my supporters on Patreon. You're making this all possible. If you'd like to support the channel and gain some perks along the way, consider joining at any tier you'd like.